So welcome, everyone. Tonight, um, I'd like to do a presentation on behalf of the local chapter of what was the Canadian Obesity Network and now is Obesity Canada, um, to entitled Pathways to Success. The main point of this presentation is twofold. One, it's to speak to health professionals and people interested in the local Halifax, Nova Scotia area for the purpose of increasing interest in the professional um, approaches, compassionate approaches, empowering approaches to managing obesity in our city and our province. And the second is to really establish a common understanding of what this condition of obesity is. And I'm going to make the argument that there is value in viewing obesity as a chronic medical condition. And in fact, at some recent conferences that I've been at, I've heard a number of experts make the statement that 20 years from now, obesity will be seen in the same way that type 2 diabetes was, is seen now. But 20 years ago, type 2 diabetes was seen as a minor disease that wasn't really worth professional attention and that people just really needed to get their act together and smarten up and everything would be fine. All the responsibility fell to them. So those are, that's really the purpose of this presentation, and it's really a launching point. So I'd like to make a, a, a presentation that will provide us with a framework that we can use to guide our future conversations, particularly because in this area, we know that we need to engage with the health service system in Nova Scotia to, in my opinion, take obesity more seriously. We need to address this at the level of policymakers, and we need to address this, importantly, at the level of the public and the media. So this is the current um, executive of the local chapter of our network, um, and we will be looking um, in the spring of 2019 for um, individuals interested in joining the executive. You don't see here our patient representative, this representative rather, on the um, executive. That was the decision that we made, and we have um, been fortunate enough to um, uh, invite um, someone into that position. We've been active over the last couple of years, if you're not aware, and last August we put on a central library event really helping to um, really engage in a public discussion around obesity and expectations. We've worked um, to support the um, student and new professional section of uh, Obesity Canada, which is a very active group, primarily based at the Mount. They've done a lot of really interesting things. And we've also um, participated and supported the Strides for Obesity Walk. And for your information, the next walk will occur on the 13th of October, uh, coinciding with Diabetes Canada Conference. So let's get down sort of to the issue. What is obesity? And obesity really needs to be understood as a condition in which excess body fat has accumulated to such an extent that health may be negatively affected. In other words, obesity is not about weight. Obesity is really about the health consequences of excess fat in the body. Now, this is going to provide a little bit of a challenge for us because we start, most of us will orient towards this problem by taking somebody's weight. And so I've just said that obesity is really not about weight, but of course, somehow weight is always brought into the equation. And I would argue that everyone living with obesity has a tendency to focus it all about the weight. Um, so what do we know? Um, this is a worldwide problem. More than half of the adult global population was overweight or obese in 2014, and there's no reason to believe that these numbers have improved over the last five years. So what's the big deal? Is, is obesity really a medical condition as opposed to a lifestyle choice? And I think that this represents a really important um, position. And this is the position taken by the World Obesity Federation that in essence um, makes the scientific argument that fat cells are not inert. They just don't occupy space sitting in the body um, and just kind of hanging around. That fat cells in fact are endocrine organs. And if you reflect on what's written on the right side of this slide. I'll just read it quickly. As fat cells increase in size, they produce 
increased amounts of a variety of peptides and that they're associated with falls in anti-inflammatory um, uh, peptides as well. So the products of the fat cells modify the metabolic and inflammatory processes in the body, and this has both peripheral and central effects. So there's evidence that says that fat cells, in fact, are very much the mechanism of action of the health problems associated with obesity. And we know that there are a number of health problems associated with obesity, cardiovascular, respiratory, metabolic, central nervous system, cancer, inflammation-related disorders. This is a really interesting position taken last year by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American College of Endocrinology, in which they've actually suggested a new term that's really referred to as ABDC, ABCD, adiposity-based chronic disease. And so what this is really doing is helping us to understand that obesity is really not about the weight, but it's about the medical consequences of living with excess adipose tissue. And if you look at obesity as a chronic condition with serious expectations, these data suggest that as you go five points up on the BMI scale, there's a 40% mortality rate increase based on ischemic heart disease, stroke, other vascular diseases. And you can see that generally there's some evidence to suggest that those that live with obesity in the sort of class one and two, they have a reduction of about three years in their life expectancy, above 40, eight to 10 years reduced. Here's some very recent data published just a couple of months ago that looks at over 300 million life years of data um, this is sort of a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, if you will. And what you can see here is the lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease with regard to morbidity and mortality based on weight. And you can see both for middle-aged men and middle-aged women that as their category of obesity rises, so does the hazard ratio of, um, of cardiovascular disease. Another population-based study, this one based in the U.S., is really looking at um, body mass index and um, health lifestyle. And so here they're really indexing five lifestyle behaviors, diet, smoking, physical activity, alcohol consumption, BMI. When you just look at the BMI, this is the red box on the top, you can see the increase in the hazard ratio of deaths resulting from any cause, all cause mortality. Um, and you can see that above the BMI of 35, 1.67 um, hazard ratio. If you look over on the far right, the hazard ratio for CBD deaths goes to 2.58 in that category. And then similarly, if you keep looking down, you'll see that the more health behaviors, the lower the risk. So this is scary and optimistic at the same time, but really showing that weight is a problem from a health perspective. And the corollary of that is true, that weight loss is associated with dramatic improvements in health. And so here is evidence around the um, benefits of a 5 to 10% weight loss. And so you see consistent results suggesting a reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes, improvement in blood pressure, blood lipids, reduction in CV mortality, improvements in sleep apnea, and improvements in quality of life. So modest, achievable weight loss goals have been associated with dramatic improvements. And this is a bit of a complicated slide, but it's really, I think, helping us to understand the medical benefits of weight loss in the context of uh, chronic disease management. And so really this suggests a dose-dependent, tissue-dependent biological effect of weight loss. And you can see in the columns, what can you expect from 5%, 11%, 16% weight loss? And you can see intrahepatic triglycerides, respond to as low as 5% weight loss, as does um, adipose tissue volume, as insulin sensitivity, both in the adipose tissue as well as the liver and the muscle, and beta cell functioning. It suggests, though, to get benefits from the tissue biology or inflammatory markers, then the sort of bar needs to be increased to maybe 10% or 15% body weight loss. 
Um, but again, these are not terrific amounts of weight loss in terms of the medical benefits. Um, I'll just sort of make a, a brief couple of comments about Canada, just so that we locate this kind of appropriately. Um, so these are sort of a couple of infographics that really show us that Canada, um, you know, has nothing really to be proud of when it comes to obesity rates and risks. Uh, first note that most um, of the major sort of medical associations, including um, the World Health Organization, Canadian Obesity Network, uh, Canadian Medical Association, now American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, have really ca categorized obesity as a chronic disease, and that we reflect on the prevalence of this threefold increase in self-reported prevalence since 1985 in Canada. Currently, one in four Canadians live with obesity, and that data is five years old, and that significant weight occurs in one in 11 Canadians. Um, if you look in the middle part, you can see that we have weight, and, and I just wanted to reference, I'll talk a bit about this because I think one of the things that will need to be uh, examined and considered is how do we define the problem. And <clears throat> obesity by weight and BMI has some problems attached to it. And then the, we, we're lucky because we do have the uh, Edmonton Obesity Staging System that I'd like to, to introduce to you briefly in a few minutes. And also there's the indication around um, waist circumference. Um, as a complex disease, we can see that there's a huge number of problems, and these are Canadian-based data looking just at the consequences of class 2 obesity. So these would be people living with obesity at BMIs between 35 and 40. And you can see the challenges associated with that. For every 10% increase in body weight, a six-fold risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea. So we can see that from a medical point of view, there's a lot of risks. So what my first takeaway for you in this presentation is to really, if we're going to view obesity as a chronic condition, then the management of obesity is less about weight loss than it is about the achievement of health, function, and quality of life. So that's a, a bit of a sticking point in a way because, of course, there will be weight changes. But I think the important point is that it's, a, is that it's the health of the individual it's their functional ability and their quality of life that should really be primary when we consider what are the best outcomes. Okay, now as we understand this dilemma of obesity management, it's really important for us to appreciate the biology because we are very much limited by our biology and the evidence appears to be quite isolated from the um, narrative that you hear in a public environment or the narrative that you hear even in a professional environment about weight and the achievement of weight. We very much have a tendency, certainly in the public domain, but I would also argue in the professional domain, to think that there is a relationship between effort and outcome when it comes to weight. And the evidence suggests that that is actually not a valid approach, and that the effort and the outcomes really need to be reconsidered. And so the first point to make is really this, this need to, to feed. Um, and if you think about even the quote from Voltaire in you know, the 17th century, nothing would be more tiresome than eating and drinking if God not had made them a pleasure as well as a necessity. In other words, it's long been known that food is positive, that there is a very strong drive. Drive for food is one of the most powerful human animal behaviors. And as a result, so no surprise, there are multiple neural systems that control food intake and body weight. Now, I'm not going to go through those in great detail. This is not intended to be a neurophysiological talk. But I do want to just note that all of us who work in this field really need to be aware of what we're actually dealing with. And the important point of this slide is really to talk about the fact that the, the brain kind of controls hunger, fullness, and the sort of um, drive to eat based on, on both homeostatic as well as hedonic neural systems. And what that sort of means is that, is that we have reasons to eat for our um, 
nutritional requirements, but we also have a hedonic system, a pleasure-based system. And there's lots of reasons to believe that when we talk about the current built environment as an obesogenic environment, what we're really talking about is that the hedonic neural systems are tending to dominate and that if eating is less about hunger and more about cravings, more about the drive to eat. And that's just sort of um, depicted here. This is a, a, a kind of a cutaway of, of a more de detailed slide. And my point in showing you this is really to tell you that, that the sort of neurobiology, so how the brain connects to the gut in particular and the abdomen and all of our sort of organs involved in the management of and regulation of feeding behavior have been actually fairly well mapped out. So if this is an, in, is an area that you're interested in, you'll find that there is quite a lot of very high quality evidence that really maps into various um, neural clusters that really drive reward emotions food-seeking behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice to know that when it actually comes to what's really going on in terms of how the body processes the, um, the hunger, fullness, and the pursuit of food, that things are pretty well mapped out. Now, the unfortunate part is, as we understand the neurobiology, we also understand that there are long-term, persistent, hormonal adaptations to weight loss. In other words, what we've come to understand is that the body resists weight loss and that when an individual has achieved a high weight and then they lose weight, that there is a counter-regulatory biological response to regain that weight. And so I'm just going to show you a, a few slides just to make that point home and that following the initiation of weight loss, hormones change as early as 10 weeks, and they are persistent for quite a long period of time. And at a sort of level of hormonal functioning, there's reductions. Adaptations favor weight regain by reducing insulin, leptin, PYY, CCK, GLP-1, increases in ghrelin. And all of these are, are food um, pursuit hormones. Um, and so what we see really is that there's this very strong counter-regulatory response for increase in energy intake with an increase in the hunger and the drive to eat and redu reduced energy expenditure so that the body will actually compensate. This is an interesting study, if you're not familiar with it, and it's colloquially referred to as the biggest loser study. And basically, a group of physiologists have studied the 2009 season of the biggest loser, and they followed these individuals over six years. And so what this has really allowed them to do is kind of look at what happens to these individuals in terms of body weight and their resting metabolic rate knowing, of course, that resting metabolic rate is really responsible for the vast majority of your energy expenditure in a day. And so if you look at the two um, uh, boxes that are highlighted, they are weight and resting metabolic rate over six years. So we have three time points, the columns, baseline, end of the competition, so the end of the season when the winner is announced, and then that follow-up. And what you can see is that body weight went from about 149 kilograms and dropped to 90 kilograms. So what a huge weight loss in these individuals on average. But they've regained 85% of their weight six years later. So they're now back up to 136 as a group. If you look at their resting metabolic rate, this is what gets really, really scary. They started out at the beginning of the season with a resting metabolic rate of about 2,600 calories. In other words, if they, they would have to eat more than 2,600 calories to gain weight. Then as we know, with weight loss, you get a compensatory reduction in energy expenditure. I just made that comment. And so in this particular case, it drops to 2,000. So now at the end of the 30 weeks of competition, if they eat over 2,000 calories a day, they'll gain weight. Now, six years later, even though they've regained 85% of their weight, their resting metabolic rate has not changed. And so what you can see is just how problematic this becomes. 
So now six years later, they're still going around, and if they eat more than 2,000 calories, they're going to gain weight. So it really suggests that there's some strong neurobiological counter-regulatory responses. So the biology and the neurobiology becomes really important for us to respect and understand as we work with people to help them identify goals, help them commit to long-term behaviors. Um, my final comments around the sort of biology is just to, to sort of look at some of the evidence that's been around for a very long time, look at the date of this study that shows the sort of heritability of obesity, the, the genetic contribution. And here is a um, data looking at overweight and obese male twins. So prospective 25-year follow-up study, height, body weight, BMI were assessed in a sample of almost 2,000 monozygotic, just over 2,000 diazygotic male twin pairs. And the heritability of both height, weight, and BMI was really, really strong. And so if you kind of see at age 20 and then at a 20-year follow-up, it's really demonstrating the power of biology in moving forward. So how do we understand the person living with obesity in the context of these biological fundings? Um, and so I think one of the things that is important is how do we assess, given what I've said? Because there's this little conundrum that we have where you know we, we tend to, to assess, we tend to engage people around weight, and yet it seems like weight is not really the necessary outcome. That if a person has over their life gained 100 pounds, 50 kilograms, and they come to see you for treatment, they're looking for help, or their self-esteem is impacted, or they're trying to make changes, and they want to lose all of those 50K, the evidence says it's very unlikely that they will do so and that there's strong counter-regulatory responses that will make it balancing. So how do we engage with people? What is it that would be an alternative to just this measure of weight? And so if you're not familiar with it, it would be helpful for you to be familiar with the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. And so this is what it looks like. And you can see that it's really around multiple channels of assessment. So it's not just your weight. So we would look at your weight, but the question really is, at your weight, what's going on at a medical, mental, and functional? Remember, health, function, quality of life. And then individuals living with obesity could be staged. So you could have two individuals with exactly the same weight who one individual might be stage one, some the second individual may be stage four. And so what this is really doing is, 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 is embellishing weight to actually include what may in fact be the most important markers. And what's also really nice about this is you could imagine that intervention may not have a great effect on weight, but it might have a great effect on health, on function, and on quality of life. But to carry through the system, if you have absent of medical, mental, and functional, you might be obese, but you're stage zero on the Edmonton obesity staging system. So someone who would fit into that category wouldn't necessarily be encouraged to lose weight, they would be encouraged to be healthy and certainly to, to not gain weight, sorry. And so if you have preclinical factors or mild, that's stage one, comorbid factors, moderate in mental functional impairments, stage two, um, and as we go forward, excuse me, I have a, a flight tomorrow. As we go forward, you can see end organ damage, and then finally, sort of that stage four is almost palliative in nature. Um, now, there's been research that's looked at how does the staging system actually compare to BMI, and just these are the data. So what you see is the really um, looking at predicted models of mortality using NHANES 3 data. On the left is using BMI category, and on the right is using the EOS stage. And you can see here just how strongly predictive the EOS is relevant to BMI. So just to inform you that um, there are broader systems for understanding individuals. And I personally like this because it's not just a weight focused, but it's really very much focused on health function and quality of life. So let me now talk a bit about what does this mean for clinical management? And really the question that I would have is, what is it that really would have to change? And so let's just kind of look at um, this sort of what would be seen as an interpersonal transactional relationship. 
So what you really have is this tendency in health for people to be the uninformed help seeker with the expert clinician. In other words, from a transactional point of view, the rescuer, the person who has the keys to the castle, and the victim, the helpless victim who needs help. And so this is the sort of often the way that this stands out or starts out with obesity management. Now notice the, the rescuer has a, is guilty, right? And why is the rescuer guilty? Because the rescuer knows that they're not an expert. Right now, if you talk to primary care doctors, you talk to most doctors, they would say, I'm not an obesity specialist. I don't really know much about it. So patients come for help. And, you know, medical providers, we try to do what we can, but really it's not so great. And so then what happens next? Well, I will help you. So we then try to um, move into um, this relationship um, and we do the best we can. But now what happens? It sort of shifts. All of a sudden, we feel that the patient isn't following our recommendations. You're non-adherent, you're non-compliant, you've cheated. And of course, the patient tries to rescue the clinician by owning that, really endorsing that, eat less, move more, it's all a behavioral choice, somehow I'm failing. And then we end up in the situation where the patient feels betrayed and the clinician feels helpless. So if you think about management of chronic conditions, they really have a very strong relational dynamic. And this transactional analysis that I've just summarized more often than not describes what happens. It starts out okay, but it does not end up okay. And so what we really need to do is make a shift and one of the most important shifts is to really understand the lived experience of the individual who has obesity and what it is that we can do to address this. And so this is a recent paper that the group in Halifax with uh, Sarah's Kirk Research Group and many of us are in, who have worked in this have really had a, a look at this. And when we look at this from a sociological framework, that for the individual environment, the one main theme that really came out of this uh, qualitative study was that food is really a blessing and a curse, that it's used as a coping mechanism, but it's also a source of emotional distress. So we really have to somehow embrace that ambivalence. We have to really look at the consequences of eating and obesity, not just as causal factors that lead to, but also as uh, subsequent factors um, um, that are part of the sort of negative vicious cycle that people can get into. At the level of the interpersonal environment, the two things that came up really were the bias issues that people experience, blame and shame by family members and friends because of their weight, um, and condemnation and lack of support from healthcare providers. So these are really common and very profound issues. And one of the things that um, we believe by framing obesity as a medical condition, by respecting the, um, the fat cell as a endocrine organ that is contributing directly to disease, by recognizing the metabolic and genetic factors that make weight to be very challenging to control directly, that this all will help to reduce blame and shame and actually help healthcare providers figure out that it is their job to work to support the individual. To finish this out at an organizational level, the one main theme that came here was just really inadequate support for mental well-being issues in obesity management programs. So this was quite interesting to us, that, that what this sort of suggested was that the approaches to managing weight tended to be very much about let's get control of your weight. And individuals were saying, well, the mental health issues tended to be really big for them. So there was a real sense to which there was not enough mental health um, issues addressed within obesity management programs. And then at a community level, it was really the negative mental well-being impact of the social stigma, just what it's like to live in the world uh, that we currently live in. So, so we've got on the one hand the biology. We've got, uh, I think, a fairly common dysfunctional relationship. And then we have individuals who have very clear ideas of just how poorly they are treated. So this really, I think, forms the framework for where we can go next. And also was really the 
framework behind the development of the five A's of obesity management, which are ask. So first thing we do is we need to understand the individual, then collaboratively understand the problem. What are the drivers of obesity? How did you get to be the weight you are? What are the factors that interfere? So we assess both medically, but also functionally quality of life. Advise. We then ask permission to, to, to make recommendations. We then agree. We then negotiate with our patients which pathway to change would be most likely to help them. And the pathway that is most likely to help them is the pathway that is going to make the most sense to them that they can actually commit to. And then we engage in a process of trying to support them. Um, I just wanted to show you this data. This is a meta-analysis data um, looking at what happens when physicians give weight loss advice and pay, what happens to patient behavior. And what you can see, if you just look on the right, those are all the individual studies. And if you look at, at the one, that's the middle point, and to the left of the one, it, it really um, you know, shows no provider advice on the right provider advice. And just what this does, the odds ratio of patient weight loss attempt based on recommendations. And so it really suggests that if, if healthcare providers are engaged in a supportive way, making what we call sensitive recommendations, it actually has evidence-based impact on the attempts that individuals make. So this is good reason for the relationship dynamic. So what are the key indicators in success in weight management approaches? And so, you know, diet, medication, surgery equals weight loss? No. So that may sound strange, but it's actually not in the diet. There's no magic in the diet. There's no magic in medication. And there's really not a lot of magic in surgery. So where is the magic? Adherence. In other words, what we need to think about with regard to the indicators of success is the degree to which participants continue or meet the goals. That is, if they're provided with a, a lifestyle-based intervention, how well do they adhere to that? If they're offered medication, do they adhere? If they're offered surgery, do they adhere pre-post-surgery? And so this is a little bit of a, of a comment about our current approaches. And if you step back and look at how we currently approach obesity management, most people have a program to offer. That is, you kind of have a pathway already before you've even seen the patient. And so many programs are offered in this particular way. And so when then, what then ends up happening is that the patient has to fit the program. And my comment to us as a profession is to think about that. Do we expect patients to fit the program and then do that forever? Or would it surprise us to know that if somebody bends themselves into a pretzel to fit any program, as long as they're getting enough support to make that program work, it'll work, but they may not sustain. So current weight management interventions tend to focus on methods. What is it? Not the drivers, not the why. So the question isn't, you know, kind of like, what is it to do? But the question is, why would you want to do this? There's many, many things that you can do, multiple pathways. And the question really is for helping us to engage an individual so that what they take on, they will continue with. So this current approach unwittingly establishes environmental control strategies that support short-term, not long-term behavior. And how do we know that? The following statements are so common in clinical work. The more often I see you, the easier it is for me to stay on track. When you stop seeing me, I can't continue to stay on track, which suggests that what's really happening here, this environmental control, which is called operant conditioning, and the basis of operating, operating conditioning is really that behaviors will, will repeat. They will, the signal strength of a behavior will increase if it's reinforced. And that means something's added or something negative is taken away. So getting something good and have something bad taken away are both positive. Those are reinforcers. Behaviors will extinguish or be stopped. This action st signal strength will go down if, either, if, a, if, a, if a punishment occurs which is a negative or the removal of a positive. So what does this mean? Most of us experience the following. During a program, the patients are excited and we're providing a lot of positive reinforcement, but they experience stopping our programs as negative punishment. So from a behavioral perspective, what are sort of appropriate goals that we could work with? 
And so lifestyle behaviors, which I would include medication adherence and surgery adherence as lifestyle behaviors, they, they have to refer, if, it's a, if, you're, if your behavior is really part of your lifestyle, what that tells us is that those are behaviors that are consistent over time and carry across different situations. So lifestyle behaviors do not need to be externally reinforced. And the lifestyle behaviors reflect two constructs. And so this is becoming more and more clear in the literature. You'll see this reflected in the next clinical practice guidelines in obesity. With behavioral interventions, what is the mechanism of action? So what seems to be the most uh, important mechanisms by which people can benefit with behavior change interventions? And there are two things. One is they engage in activities that increase their self-efficacy, which is their confidence and their ability to continue with these behaviors in the face of barriers, and the development of intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic. So lifestyle interventions are not really about identifying. They're really about identifying drivers and then promoting behaviors that are internalized. So really, when we think about the drivers, right, that sort of suggests to us that we, as health providers, shouldn't be invested in any one pathway. Just like if you go to an endocrinologist with type 2 diabetes or if you go to um, cardiologists with you know, heart cardiovascular disease, they're not going to give you one pathway. They're really going to identify what your particular presentation is, and they're going to choose a treatment that matches you. And so if we take that approach, we can think there are nutritional pathways, activity pathways, medication, surgical pathways, and it's really about supporting patients and finding the pathway that works for them. Now, the strategies that are most successful, we know you lose weight through energy deficit, you maintain weight through activity and a calorie imbalance. We know that there is many things that work. And so one way of thinking about this is that these pathways are the doing component. And in this slide, I just wanted to sort of help to contextualize that doing. As you work with people to engage them in a process by which they're going to make efforts at weight management, the doing, I just want to make note that there are two constructs that can be really helpful to you prior to the doing. And those are the issues around bias, self-bias as well as bias toward, from others. And I sometimes communicate that with patients by asking them two questions. When you look in the mirror, do you like what you see? And when you walk down the street, can you hold your head up? And so this really helps us to identify self-esteem related issues that are probably really important to incorporate as you get into the doing. Similarly, with expectations, we know that people really have very, very high expectations. And if somehow people maintain extremely high expectations as they engage in doing activities, they might be disappointed. If we can help people shift from hoped for expectations to lived satisfaction with the outcomes of their efforts, then we will be much better at helping them with the doing. On the right side, you can see that as people get engaged in the doing, what you want to be mindful of is the wanting and the thinking, the cravings and the cognitions, because there's often a number of these, you know, we sometimes refer to permission thoughts. You know, I've had a really, really hard day. I just need something good to eat. And so people will use cognitive and, um, and then the um, craving related. Now, before we sort of wrap up, I just want to say that in all of these pathways, there's evidence. So this is data looking at the eight-year um, weight loss in the intensive lifestyle intervention and the look-ahead trial. And you can see that 37% of people have lost um, at one year, 37% of people have lost more than 10% of their body weight. 27% have kept that off, greater than 10% body weight at eight years. And so if you look at greater than 10% with the intensive lifestyle intervention, really you've got about 38% um, have lost more than 10% of their body weight. So this is suggesting that you know, lifestyle behaviors can be quite effective. Um, 38, so we know that this is problematic. This is very optimistic, rather. This is a recent trial published called the DIRECT trial, which is really a sort of a calorie-restricted uh, um, uh, um, uh, intervention. Um, no medications here at all. And if you look at the slides on the right side, you can see the percentage of weight loss that um, the, um, you know, 86% of people lost more than um, 15 um, uh, kilograms. So 
achieving lots of weight loss. And so the point here is behavioral interventions can be effective if they take advantage of the sort of best evidence around um, management of behavior. Um, I just throw this slide in. This is the Diet Fits randomized trial that was recently um, publicized that tried to look at, can you match treatments to patients? So is it low carb versus low fat? What about genotypes or insulin secretion patterns? And this was a really nice, well done study that basically said when people restrict calories, they lose weight, and that there was really nothing that would suggest that one approach is better than another, or one, one genetic or insulin profile would really result in better outcomes than another. So um, maybe it's time to start to stop the diet wars, to, to stop this approach of what is the best diet, and really think about what are the diets that make most sense to the individuals that incorporate calorie restriction that can be lived with as long as you can. There are three anti-obesity medications in Canada. There's Xenical, Saxenda, and Contrave. And there's evidence um, behind each of those. Um, these are the Orlistat data, uh, 11 uh, kilogram loss at one year, seven at four. This is the liraglutide, uh, sex ended data, 9% at one, 7% at three. And this is the contrave um, looking at uh, computer analysis. And again, you can see there are significant differences um, over time in um, outcome. So medications have effect. Um, there are obviously successes with bariatric surgery, and you can see a number of procedures. Um, banding is becoming less favorable in favor of the gastrectomy and the um, sort of uh, bypass uh, surgeries, which um, you can see on the slide are also associated with weight loss. So the point there really is that there are um, evidence-based um, um, medical management approaches that incorporate lifestyle, medications, surgery. So let's finish up. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, and so I'll finish up in the next few minutes. But there's really two things to, to finish on. One is I just wanted to make you aware, if you're not already aware, of the um, Obesity Canada's report card on access to obesity treatments for adults in Canada. This was released last year. And these are just the infographics. Um, and if you just were to scan this over, um, you could see that you know things are not looking really, really good. If you look on the left in the blue box, access to specialists and interdisciplinary teams for behavioral treatments. And it really shows that there's very, very little. Um, I mean, if you reflect on the fact that there are over 80,000 physicians in the country and only 40 have really obtained their um, certification in, as obesity specialists. Um, we know that access to medically supervised re meal replacements is a very, very um, strong out-of-pocket cost for individuals. Um, access to medication is really quite poor. Uh, there's uh, the sort of pharmacare programs and the federal drug benefit programs. None of them are really addressing this. And if you look at surgery on the far right, the purple box, you can see that wait times and access is, is really quite poor in most provinces. And it's a bit alarming if you look at the top part of that infographic and you see that, you know, in some provinces, such as in Quebec, one in 90 eligible patients can access surgery. In Nova Scotia, it's one in 1,100, 1,312. So we know that there's a lot of uh, important outcomes. And so the calls to action, which I think would potentially be a good rallying point for all of us, those of us interested in the promotion of obesity management as a chronic condition, the compassionate, evidence-based, uh, collaborative, empowering approach, is that we need to treat obesity as a chronic condition, reduce stigma and bias, access um, evidence-based treatments through both public and private payers, we need to increase training in health professionals, and this is something that I think we could really take on with our local chapter, um, build capacity for the development of teams, and work on the guidelines, which in fact will be released at the next uh, Obesity Canada Summit in the spring of 2019 in Ottawa. My last comment to you is just to make you aware that um, 
through Obesity Canada, we've created a Certified Bariatric Educator Program. And now this is a program, and it's sort of been developed akin to what we have in diabetes. So if you have familiar familiarity with diabetes management, you'll know about Certified Diabetes Educators, which is a very well-known, well-accepted um, diploma that is offered to individuals who meet certain criteria. Well, we sort of modeled off of that to create this um, program for um, bariatric education. The learning outcomes really are here, um, and it's um, encouraging people to, this is often done by professionals who are out of school working, so it's something that's often done on the side. Um, the criteria really would be um, completion of a, of a course um, that can be offered, and it, there, there are a number of different courses, 700 hours of, of practical experience related to obesity management, 